looking at theories of ethics, we can see how they were constructed. In most cases, there is a more or less clear hierarchy of levels in a theory. Each level is built upon the previous one. We can also look at them as forming a chain, starting from the most important one. Each next link in the chain is being justified by placing it in the context of the links preceding it. The building blocks of an ethical theory are standards or rules, acts or behaviors, and welfare or well-being. We can add more elements to this picture to make the theory fuller and more complicated, but right now I'm just interested in a very limited analysis. The three elements could, in principle, be arranged in any order, but what we find is that they are in fact ordered only in two ways. The first one I will call top-down. It starts by listing ethical standards and rules. These are laws. These are the thou shalls and thou shall nots. The laws say what is good and what is bad. These standards define values. The next link in the chain are acts. Acts are judged directly by fitting them to the standards. An act is good or bad by virtue of it fitting into a thou shall or thou shall not respectively. And the final link, the least important one, is welfare of the one who commits the act and the one to whom something is being done. And here, as was the case previously, the actual well-being of someone is considered to be ethically good or bad by referring to the standards from the first link. An individual is being wronged when someone behaves badly toward him. An individual is being wronged when someone behaves badly toward him. An individual commits a wrong deed when he is breaching a law. I call it a top-down strategy as it starts with the most abstract concepts and proceeds from there to more concrete levels. The second strategy is the reverse, bottom-up. It starts from the most concrete level and builds on it. The foundation is made of welfare, conscious states of humans or sentient beings in general. Here we find the richness of emotional landscape, feelings of pleasure, pain, joy, suffering, excitement, fear, satisfaction, loss. Virtually all of these are easy to identify as either positive or negative. Feelings that are actively sought out are generally positive. We define them to be good. Feelings that are avoided are negative, hence bad. The next level is that of acts. An act is judged as being good or bad only in so far as it results in good or bad mental states. This directly translates to the most abstract level, ethical laws. An ethical standard is considered to be a good one when it is conducive to behaviors that lead to positive mental states. Also, a law that forbids actions leading to negative emotions is a good law, and conversely, a rule that promotes acts resulting in negative feelings is itself bad. We see how each link in the chain, in both top-down and bottom-up theories, gets its ethical evaluation based on the previous one, ending in the most fundamental one. The focus on results versus the focus on laws is nothing new, of course. In ethics, there already is a clear distinction between the two. Each approach has its history, its main philosophers, and arguments for and against it. Putting ultimate value in mental states and judging actions based on the outcomes is in the domain of the ethics called consequentialism. Acts have positive value when they lead to increasing of positive states or when they decrease negative states. The goal is to either maximize good feelings or to minimize the bad ones. On the other hand, valuing above all else ethical laws is called deontology. Rules have to be followed, regardless of the consequences they may lead to. Both of these approaches have some problems. Deontological systems that put laws as the foundation often have problems explaining why we should follow a particular law in all circumstances, but more importantly, 
by seeing consequences the concrete lived experiences of sentient beings as secondary considerations, sometimes following a law leads to clearly bad outcomes as experienced by affected subject, but also as recognized by the observers. Consequentialist systems don't have an easy task of building general standards that could be followed, but the real problem arises when there is a conflict between experiences of several subjects. Is sacrificing one being to maximize positive results of several other individuals still good? This was just an overview of the two general frameworks for building ethical theories. Of course, the examples are very simplistic, but I hope they were clear enough to explain some key ideas. In future, I want to dig deeper into some issues related to ethics, so I treat this entry as an introduction and a warm-up for things to come. Have a good one!